This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. So, Melissa Lutke is the inaugural recipient of the Chairman's Fellowship for Numismatic Research, uh, which will go forward towards funding her dissertation research, uh, which is titled Causa and Socioeconomic Interactions about, uh, uh, among Middle Republican cities in Central and South Etruria. She's a doctoral candidate in classical archaeology at Florida State University, where she earned also her MA in classical archaeology. And uh, Lutke has worked on the cause excavation in Ancedonia, Italy, since 2016. And uh, she works now also at the Excavation Coins Inventory project with the Superintendence Archaeologica della Toscana since 2022. And her dissertation investigates the introduction, the interactions between Cosa and neighboring cities in the third century BCE. So welcome here. So we're very much looking forward to what you have to say on the topic. Thank you. Great. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Lucia, for the very kind introduction. Um, and I also want to thank the ANS again for granting me the Chairman's Fellowship for Numismatic Research uh, for funding my dissertation. Uh, definitely necessary, and I already put it to good use this summer, traveling to different sites and, and get a hold of different museums and photographs and, and all of that good, fun stuff. <laughs> so uh, as you may notice from the title of today's uh, talk, uh, Numismatic Pathways, Coins and Coses Bath Complex, uh, I'm actually not discussing the, my dissertation research over much today. I'll touch on the Cosa coins a little bit, uh, at least in the introduction of the numismatic chronology of the site itself. Uh, but I am going to be actually presenting preliminary findings from uh, the Florida State University excavations of a Roman bath complex at Coza, which has a much broader spread of uh, numismatic material. However, uh, there will be another long table session in the future with more on my findings of uh, my dissertation research. So stay tuned for that as well. And I'm happy to answer any questions about that project. And also, of course, any questions at the end about this project as well. But just keeping in mind that the research today is definitely preliminary. So I'm still kind of pouring through the analysis of the material, especially since we just finished our um, most recent excavation season. For 2023 and not everything is you know upload, uploaded or analyzed as yet especially since we had a few uh, hiccups this summer too uh, but first uh, before jumping right into the numismatic material i am also going to begin with a brief overview of the city of coza and uh, mainly for those who may not know much about the site and its history because i know not everybody is an archaeologist um, and there is more of a kind of an interest in numismatics here as well. So just for kind of a geographic reference, the colony of Coza, the Latin colony of Coza, is located on the western coast of Italy, kind of in or about the border between Latium and Etruria, but firmly situated in modern Tuscany and Etruria. And uh, as I'll discuss its history in a second, we have a rather small colony in size, which has really kind of confounded historians and archaeologists over many, many years of research of the site. And the excavation history as well is quite extensive. Uh, as you can see from the map on the screen uh, here, you can see the location of Coza, but then also here is a rendering of the areas of the site that have been excavated and the uh, roughly the outline of the walls and the extent of the city itself, which again is, is pretty small, especially you know, if you compare it to Pompeii or say Pestum, another uh, Southern colony. And then on the bottom, you can see some older aerial photographs. It's showing the arcs uh, down here, one of the high points of the city and then also the forum and how they kind of relate to each other as well. So that's just a general location of the site and the city that we are discussing. In terms of its history, it has a very long history, but a very spotty history. Uh, so it begins actually with the fall of Volci to Rome in Etruscan city in about 280 BCE, and the region itself undergoes a lot of change. 
a lot of um, that, you know, mid-century or mid-Republican change, transition, a lot of towns in the region around, in which Koza is a part of are destroyed at this time. And on the heels of that, uh, Rome grants and founds a new Latin colony with Latin rights under the designation of Coza, uh, which actually may come from an older Etruscan settlement, but not on the actual uh, hill itself. We've never found Etruscan material in any sort of abundance. There are some tombs a little bit lower down on the hillside, but never any uh, secure evidence of a settlement beneath the Republican layers. So as far as we're, we know, uh, it was a colony founded from scratch in about 273 BCE, and that is uh, told to us by Livy as well. So there's both literary evidence for that foundation date and um, potentially archaeology, archaeological evidence that I'll discuss in a little bit. However, uh, Coza has been called an, a weird colony or an unusual colony because it doesn't uh, fit many of the Roman, Roman models uh, that had been studied extensively uh, when it was first being researched in any great detail. Uh, it, it was often used as a model for those Roman colonies uh, with the orthogonal layout of the streets, et cetera. But everything was slightly off. It was considered maybe sort of a backwater, uh, but we do know that it had somewhat of a slow start. So although it was founded in 273, the excavations early and in the 90s and also today haven't really found an abundance of third century material, which is also interesting considering what I'll discuss in a little bit, the coins. So we don't have many buildings. We have the walls probably built about that time, uh, maybe a couple of buildings in the forum, maybe a temple or two, but not really much and no houses have been discovered so far dating to the third century. And we think this might be a reason uh, as to why, especially right after the, the end of the Punic Wars, uh, that we have a petition for more colonists between about 199 that was finally fulfilled in 197 BCE, so at the beginning of the second century. And at this time, it kind of uh, springboards a very prosperous second century BCE for the site. So this is when kind of the height of its economy that was carried over a little bit into the beginning of the first century BCE. But this is uh, the second century was really booming for this small town, mainly over down near the port as well. So this is when we have um, the monopoly of the Sestii family. Uh, taking over the wine and the fish trade at this point in time, and it seems like the town itself was doing well. The forum was built up, houses were beginning to be built inside the town, and a lot of instruction and economic activity comes from this period. Unfortunately, something happened. We're not sure what. Uh, maybe we have some evidence of destruction, burning, fire, etc. Perhaps uh, an unfortunate individual lost their life as well during the 70s BCE. And this is at this point we see a big decline in the city. Uh, we don't have a lot of late Republican material, and there's uh, virtually no material or very little material between about the 70s and the Augustan period. So there's this gap of time that has led archeologists to really think that the city was even abandoned at this time. Uh, we just don't have much to say what is going on uh, and there's an absence of material. And then as I just mentioned in about the Augustan period, we have an early imperial reconstruction, an influx of wealth, a lot of buildings were constructed and reconstructed during this time period. And this carried into the second century CE uh, as well. So there were a few, we have inscriptions and other materials tied to specific emperors as well, such as Nero, who also put some money into the restoration and the reconstruction. There were some earthquakes potentially happening in the late Republic as well. So at this time, we do see some imperial money uh, kind of given over. And it is also thought perhaps that is what may have funded the public bath complex. We've pinpointed the initial construction of it being used as a bath at about the second century CE under Hadrian, as we'll go over again later. However, historically, uh, among historians and archaeologists both, 
There has been a thought that after the third century CE, we see a very sharp or gradual, depending on what you what you look at, uh, decline in the city. So we see a drop off of building, we see a drop off of settlement, habitation. The coins themselves seemed to have initially dropped off at about that time. And there doesn't seem to be much really happening and, and building kind of stops at about the third century too. So. Uh, under some of the earlier archaeologists, uh, excavators of the site, it was thought that after this time, the site became, again, back to being what it was at the beginning, a, a backwater. Uh, it's not mentioned much in literature besides a very late account that only rats live at Koza now. Uh, so it was considered pretty much all but abandoned. We do know that uh, definitely after the 6th century CE, there was a significant period of aban general abandonment of the site. Uh, perhaps there were still shepherds on, um, you know, using it for grazing. We're not really sure, but the material after the sixth century really does drop off, and the coins themselves reflect that too. However, there is somewhat of a resurgence, uh, and potentially some intermittent settlement that occurred during the medieval period. Some small settlement. There were some burials up in the high parts of the city, and there were also some. Uh, other type of structures, you know, some sanctuaries still visited. And that also is very interesting to our history of the city. So this is kind of just a general overview of the site that we're discussing. In terms of the excavation history of the site, uh, it has been very extensive and, and long. So uh, before even excavation began in about 1948 and dating into the late 1900s, there were a lot of tentative explorations of the site. It was privately owned land. Um, so some aerial photos were done in the 40s. And then also uh, there was a military base during World War II up there. So there were some kind of some things going on in that time period, but not really any extensive excavation until on the heels of World War II, uh, Frank Brown ended up starting excavations in about 1948, and they were kind of stop and start until about 1972. And the results of those excavations have been extensively published. So you can see um, the 1993 uh, publication on the houses and the forum, then there's also excavation, uh, another publication on the arcs. And so there's a lot of material out there about COSA and its history, although we're still almost rebuilding that history as we go to. In about, uh, or between 1965 and 1972, were the excavations down at the port, the Portus Cozanus, uh, by McCann and her team. Uh, kind of some of the first revolutionary underwater excavations occurred there, and we get an idea of when the port itself was might have been constructed at the harbor, and several of the buildings and the spring house, et cetera, down uh, kind of off to the southeast of the actual hill of the city. Once again, the site was revisited between 1991 and 1997 under Elizabeth Fentress and her excavations. She was mainly focused on um, not only the entire city and getting a better idea of its narrative and had some kind of questions lingering there, but also really interested in what was happening post-antique and medieval period. Uh, what they discovered was a, you know, still sort of mapping onto what Brown had already discovered, the gap in time between about the 10th century and really earlier, maybe third, fourth century. And when it picks back up under the medieval period, between the say 11th to 14th century CE. Uh, so she was really focused on, as you can see down at the you know map in the bottom right, she was really focused on the areas around the arcs. Uh, they really heavily excavated a house right off of the forum. Uh, they also really explored the Eastern height, which is actually the highest portion of the hill, of the hill that Koza sits on, and also the forum, several areas in the forum, and then some of the houses over in the middle area. So trying to get a better feel of the layout of the town, but also what is going on in these areas where we're seeing continuation. There were also some excavations that occurred between 2005 and 2012 under the University of Granada in Barcelona. Uh, they primarily focused on houses and one house in particular. Uh, and their findings were also published. 
And from 2013 until current, until 2023, and there will be another season in 2024, Poza Excavations, run by Florida State University, has been exploring the Bath Building, which you can see in an old image from the publication. This is what was above ground visible at the time of Frank Brown. Uh, so we did know that it was probably a bath. It had some bath architecture, but what type of bath, the extent of the bath was very unclear. Um, Brown thought that it was, it was very small, maybe not even a public bath. And since we've excavated it, it has been a lot bigger than what we entailed. Still small, for, it fits the size of the city, but, but a lot bigger than we expected. So you can see this isn't the most recent plan because that's still being made from the latest season, but you can see the areas that have been excavated of the bath right here. Uh, and then this is the reservoir across the street. This is a street that runs right along here. Uh, and the water from the reservoir fed into the bath underneath the structure and then kind of fed the hot, the cold areas of the bath, which I'll go over in more detail in a bit. Also kind of overlapping with our excavations of the bath has been um, the excavations of a street and then off the street, uh, another house by the University of Florence. And they are also publishing their material very shortly. I think it's within the next year. Uh, so stay tuned for findings from them as well. So in terms of the just, I've been kind of throwing some, some terms out there and, and talking about the excavations. So to just get an idea of all the areas that have been excavated at the site, because they haven't been completely excavated, the site as a whole, uh, we have the forum outlined in red here and the different buildings that make up the forum. There were some temples there, a curia comitium, uh, a basilica, all at different stages of the city's history. Also of intense exploration because the large walls are still standing, you can see them from miles away, is the arcs with the potential Capitolium, it's usually termed a Capitolium, but there is no definitive evidence that it is in fact a Capitolium. Regardless, it's a very large temple on one of the highest points, the second highest point of the hill that you can see down there in the bottom. The Eastern Height, which has uh, been explored but found no structures associated with that area as of yet, had the most concentration besides the arcs, which was converted into a Christian church, of medieval settlement over in that area. And that's also where we found a medie medieval cemetery and also some medieval burials were discovered uh, near the arcs as well. So we've got some medieval things happening, settlement, occupation happening up in the higher parts of the city at this time predominantly. Of course, you have the walls which have been excavated near the gates that you see there uh, outlined in black. And then also some of the towers have been explored a little bit as well, uh, but the walls themselves are you know, partially preserved too. And the houses, uh, different houses at different times have been excavated. The one that is not on the plan yet, this is the one that is being excavated uh, or was excavated by the University of Florence. So TBD on that one, uh, but we have some houses right off of the forum, a house here as well, and then several houses in a jumble here. And this is where the site of the museum, if you are to visit COSA today, the museum is directly built right on top of the structure right here. And you can still see the house of the skeleton um, if you were to visit. The bath itself is kind of right off of this main street that opens into the main entrance of the forum here. And you can see that it doesn't completely take up the entire city block, but is at least half. Uh, we've pushed it back a little bit further and we have found the street to where it connects and opens to the street as well. And then finally, the port, uh, which you can see reconstruction of here uh, under McCann and she has um, kind of speculated on there being an emporium there. They didn't really find much archaeological evidence, but could be uh, where they think a lot of the socioeconomic activity would have occurred, especially in the second century BCE. And then you have the breakwater, uh, this area, which was the earliest that was built up in the Middle Republican period, and uh, extensive fishery channel cut to catch the fish, and then the lagoons, which are now silted up would have uh, been part of the fish production as well. 
So in terms of, now that I've given you an overview, uh, in terms of the actual coins, right? What about the numismatic material that we're here to discuss? So the numismatic material from the previous excavations has been very extensively covered. So um, Theodore Buttry published a very extensive volume on the mint of Koza, the excavation coins through about 1972, and also the hoard, which I'll discuss briefly as well, of 2004 silver denarii. So those, you know, you can, many of you might, might be even well aware of those publications uh, as well. And then in 2003, under the Fentress excavations, he also published the Greek and Roman coins from those excavations. And then Alessia Rovelli uh, published the medieval coins from those particular excavations as well. So in terms of a general chrono chronological spread of the site, um, he did a comparison between the earlier excavations and the uh, newer excavations and found that the Republican coinage, well, as a whole in 2003, or, or when it was published in 2003, in the between 1991 and 1997, there were a lot fewer uh, coins discovered at the site. Uh, as you can see, the numbers drop off, but this is also something that uh, you have to keep in mind, the history of the excavations before 1980 was extensive and spanned many years, about 40 years, whereas the time span of the uh, publication for 2003 was only about six years. So that is probably part of the disparity, but it is interesting that, you know, where the majority of the coins occur. And we do have this uh, high Republican count overall, and then a higher late imperial count, and then it drops off a little bit in the early imperial, but that seems to be between the Republican period and about fourth century CE, the height of the city, right? So we don't have very much before the founding of the city, the Hellenistic or Greek coinage, as sometimes they fall under, uh, and then we don't have much coming from later. So there is still that trend that we have some sort of a decline, at least numismatically, in about the after fourth century CE until it picks back up under the medieval period. So I put the totals from kind of each chronological period that we have at the site and the number of coins from each. This is not including the illegible coinage, uh, which I have detailed on another slide. This also doesn't include the hoard that they did find of late Republican silver denarii, which was 2004 silver coins. Uh, and also this material does include what they've determined was a um, hoard from a shrine to Liber, a later imperial shrine to Liber, and also medieval hoard from the Eastern height. So two smaller hoards uh, are included in this spread. So now I'm going to touch a little bit on, you know, my research interests for the dissertation topic, which of course is the Koza Mint. Uh, so Bachi makes a very good argument, and I agree with him as well, uh, that these coins should definitely be attributed to Koza. So uh, there were two types or two series that were uh, issued, minted, uh, for Koza, it's unclear still if they were minted at Koza specifically or minted elsewhere and brought to the colony. That is something that is still, I'm still trying to figure out if it is even possible uh, because ancient mints are so elusive, especially in the Middle Republican period. But we have a type one is of a Mars horse head. As you can see here, uh, these are not the, from the site itself. They're actually from the uh, university, uh, not university, sorry, Berlin Museum, because they have just better quality as we were discussing earlier. They're very hard to photograph and they're not in the best quality often. So these are two really good examples uh, that I used from their website, their collections. So on the left is the Mars horse head type. Uh, and you can also see another version, type two of the Koza, as Buttry calls it, um, perhaps indicating the personification of uh, the deity of the city on the obverse and the horse head on the reverse. The type two is, seems to be the most enigmatic, the most um, confusing of the two, mainly because there are so many varieties of it. It has at least two dyes, two subtypes uh, that Buttry was able to track but also is very closely associated with RRC 17-1. So that close relationship and also 
the close iconographical relationship between these coins and the Romano Campanian versions do indicate some Roman entity was involved in minting them. So that doesn't seem to be disputed whatsoever. Uh, but the date of which they were minted is also somewhat confusing. Uh, as of right now, the best that we could do is after 273, after the founding of the colony. And as um, Seth Bernard talked uh, a few weeks ago in a long table, uh, would even probably push at least the second one, second type back even further. Uh, it actually works out with the history of the city if you were to do that, because as I already mentioned, the third century material, BCE material from the city is very, very scant. Um, there's not much at all, and seemingly very few buildings were even in existence at that time. So while it may make sense to have some sort of a foundation coin tied to the mint, to the uh, you know minting of the coin tied to the foundation of the city, the actual archaeological evidence doesn't really make sense uh, to tie that together. So that is you know, still something that I am working on as well. But these two coins definitely attributed very short time span and probably only lasted for a decade or two, especially with the advent of the denarius. So that uh, large hoard that I mentioned in the picture you see here, not to be alarmed, those are actually fake and they're just a representation that is in the museum currently to show where the fine spot of the hoard was now that the building was, the museum building is built over it. Um, but the treasure itself was initially discovered in square 5D, or also termed because of the discovery, House of the Treasure. And it was actually found within a room that they identified as a pantry, uh, which is beneath or within a floor surface. And it was actually found within a commonware cooking vessel, speculated to have been constructed for a purpose of stuffing with coins, just based on the, the, the lip of the vessel. It was broken, but it wasn't broken so much that the coins were all spilled out. So it was only partially broken. And it was inserted inside a hole that was dug into the floor. And the contents were about 2004 Roman Republican, late Republican denarii. And they span from about the earliest coin uh, being around 105 BCE till its uh, burial in between 73 and 71 BCE, which has long then connected the burial or the stopping point of the coins being accumulated to that destruction decline of the city. Um, but they were the, uh, they find itself was also thought to have been buried between 73 and 71. But the interpretation was not that it was related to any sort of emergency situation, any sort of violence. It was actually an accumulation over time and a deliberate burial that was probably left and forgotten about and not added to after that decline. Something happened to the owner maybe, we're not really sure, uh, but it just stops at that point and was left in underneath the floor. So uh, that is the numismatic of material overall that has been published at the site and now I'm going to shift into new material that has not yet been published uh, from the bath complex that we're currently focused on. So the complex itself has um, been kind of added to over the years. You can see from this orthographic 3D model that the trenches are kind of piecemeal. We're trying to figure out the full extent of the bath complex. So the most recent uh, plan has not gotten to us yet, but some of the newer photos from this most recent season have been added. What is missing is the remainder of the street over here, and then this area will be finished in 2024 as well. So to just get a sense of the uh, where everything is located, you have the main entrance over here. This is a portion of the street under which the caniculus for the reservoir runs. And this street is the one that goes straight to the forum. So this is kind of the main thoroughfare. And we also have possibly tentatively some sort of a portico situation going on with these blocks here. And there was a column base found over here as well. So this seems to be uh, some exterior uh, occupation going on there. 
But you enter into this area and you have the kind of apoditarium, the changing room over here, and you can move through the building in different ways. And based on construction techniques and other features, uh, this tends to be the cold area of the bath and this is the hot area of the bath. Uh, what we have going on out here, we're still trying to figure out, but it is in the exterior of the bath building. And there is an exterior over here and the exterior over here. And of course, as I already mentioned, the street. So this is the extent that we have uncovered so far. And as you will see, the coins kind of come from almost all over, but with some interesting absences in the middle. So in terms of the bath itself, we have come up with a potential phasing of the bath, but this is still undergoing, you know, constant um, revising and trying to still finish exploring the full extent of the bath and the um, chronology as well. What we do think is that potentially, this is very tentative, but the earliest phases of construction anyway of some of the walls can date to about the Republican period and uh, not as far back as third, sec third century BCE potentially, but maybe spanning from the kind of late Republican period to about the early imperial period, potentially a house, potentially a domus was underneath what became the bath building that they kind of built into the bath building. We do believe that the initial construction was about the second century CE. So we do have brick stamps and uh, coins as well that date the bath to about the Hadrianic period. There is some uh, post-Hadrianic reconstruction, uh, potentially, you know, in, there has to be some sort of upkeep of baths. And it seems like, as I mentioned before, several emperors and, you know, might have still brought some money into the site, into the city. And we have later brick stamps as well in different areas that could indicate where they've kind of maintained the upkeep of the bath. However, after that same point in time, after about the sixth century, really, we see uh, maybe a reuse, repurposing, but we don't know exactly at what point the bath went out of use. So we see this general reuse, reoccupation, repurposing, a lot of dumps coming from the late antique and medieval period. When I say dumps, I mean, it's like they cleared out a lot of the collapse material and uh, from the abandonment and dumped it into certain areas. And this contained a lot of ceramics, a lot of tile, a lot of kind of jumbled stuff uh, that some of the coins also come from those contexts as well. But we also, after the reconstruction reuse of the building, we don't really think it's being used as a bath anymore. With that later additions, there are some walls that are added later, some floors overlaid earlier uh, time frames. So we're not so certain what they're doing at that point in time, uh, but we do know that they're still using it in some capacity and the coins also may reflect that. So in terms of the coins, um, the chronology of the bath coins, we have uh, a spread, right? And very few coins have been found in the kind of overarching chronology as well, or the, over our, uh, the, the excavations of the bath. This makes somewhat sense. Uh, it is a smaller bath. There, um, the coins are kind of in certain areas as we'll see as well. So it's not very surprising that we don't have very many. Uh, we have about, and this is just, you know, purely identifiable, solidly identified Republican material. We have about 11 coins from the Republican period, about 17 from the early Imperial period, um, 14 from the late Imperial, only one coin after about fourth century CE that is actually mostly identified as coming from that time frame. Um, three medieval coins, and then of the partially legible, we know that at least about 17 are earlier and about five come from a later period, and then seven are completely illegible. And this as a whole makes up about 75 coins so far from the bath excavations. You can see a sampling of the better uh, photographed ones. We're still in the process of, you know, getting publication ready, so not all of the photographs were um, uploaded just yet. We do have some new ones with the medieval coins, but I didn't have a very good one to show you uh, today. But this gives you a sampling of the chronology of the site. Uh, we only have two silver coins, two silver denarii as well, and both are plated and not in very good condition whatsoever. 
Uh, and also just to give you an idea of um, the different types of coins we're finding at the site as well, um, from about the, the late third century BCE, which primarily comes from within architecture or in layers of collapse, which I'll kind of touch on the significance that I find of that later, are um, one semuncha, a semis, a triens, an as, an uncha, uh, some late uh, kind of early Augustan coins, and then one denarius that we found this summer of Mark Antony. For the imperial period, we have uh, Augustus, Tiberius, Claudius, Nero, Vespasian, Nerva, Trajan, Hadrian, Commodus, and Septimius Severus. Uh, oh, and also Antoninus Pius. And then for the late, we have from Severus Alexander up to uh, three coins of Constantine. So it's kind of a smattering. We don't have a full representation of all of the emperors is what makes sense for the site. And uh, it is noticeable that there is an uptick in um, imperial asses as well, which kind of fits in, especially second century, second, third century, which fits in when we think that the bath was built, which is also really interesting. So in terms of the coin find spots, um, this is just kind of a general loose heat map so you can see where some of the examples have been discovered. Uh, so as we move through the bath, um, you can see from the main entrance right here, not exactly at that level, but there was an Augustan coin found in that area. And then you also have on the street here, we found a few Republican coins and a few late coins as well and uh, some later coins in this area, which was determined in the fill to be a, a dump as well. Uh, so moving in through here, we have areas that were termed a potential machinery room or something associated with the actual machinations of the um, area itself. Uh, and then we have kind of a furnace area here and it's a smattering. What is interesting is that in the hot areas of the bath right here, we have um, very few coins come out of those. Um, but I'll touch on, on a hypothesis for, for why that is in a little bit too. The highest concentration of coins tends to come from, uh, as we'll see, the service areas, which this might be a service corridor, and also over here as well, which would make sense in terms of traffic patterns in the bath. Um, what is curious is that we have so few coming from the main entrance, what we have deemed the main entrance. So this is just a, a representation of where the coins have been discovered and uh, for a breakdown of where those coins are kind of uh, concentrated in the terms of distribution throughout the bath. Uh, we have the southern kind of facade of the building, the exterior, which opens to Street O, that main thoroughfare connecting to the Forum. There are about seven coins discovered in that area as a whole, like across that, that spread. Uh, only one from the main entrance, as I recently mentioned. We have three coming from the apoditarium of the building as well, which is that changing room area. There are uh, four coming from this kind of exterior or maybe courtyard area. We're not really sure what's functioning over there. Um, this portion of it though contained a later dump too. Uh, then we have from this kind of southern room that's also of an unknown function but has a lot of later reuse and building of about four coins, later coins coming from there. And in the Frigidarium we have four coins coming from both this area and kind of a smattering above the floor uh, in this area as well. And uh, for the service area machinery rooms split between these two main areas, we have about 13. So as I said, total um, coming from that area from the actual bath building itself. Those are the highest areas that they come from. There are about four found in the excavations of what we've deemed kind of the well area. This portion opens up into kind of a cut down into the cistern below. So potentially water was drawn up from that area and then poured into the bath. So it's part of that kind of service area, but they were found within the actual fill of the uh, cut into that area too. The furnace area, there was a furnace kind of under here, which kind of fed the um, alveus over here, a small heated pool. And there were uh, a few coins that come from that area, about five from this spread here. 
And we also found a lot of bone hairpins, which may indicate that this could be some sort of a, of a toilette or something. We're not really sure. But the labrum here, the half labrum that you can kind of make out is not in its original location. So uh, it definitely came from the bath, but we don't know exactly what building yet or what room yet, excuse me, that it could have come from. And as I mentioned, interestingly, there are no coins that come from any of the layers of the hot rooms, uh, except for within this area of collapse of vaulting, right, which it actually came from within the deconstruction of vaulting pieces. So they're not associated with any of the occupation of the hot areas. Uh, but you can see one hot area here from the tile floor, uh, some over here, and it's hard to tell, but there are some pili, some kind of hypopost system for the heating uh, implements over here, the laconicum in this area, and another hot room here with the alveus. So there is a potential theory that I have in mind for why that is, which I'll share in a minute, but no coins come from that area. In terms of the northern exterior of the building, we don't think this might be very associated with the bath. We're tr still trying to figure out what is going on here. There are a lot of phasing, a lot of walls, uh, but a lot of the coins do come from that area as well. We have about 17 coming from outside of there. And that denarius we found this summer comes from just over here, which we found a uh, kind of cut into or a whole void that emptied out into a cistern below. So uh, that Republican coin comes from one of the lower layers of the building. And then within walls and vaulting, uh, at least one coin came uh, from the corner of this wall when we were cleaning it. And then a lot of them have come from within the vaulting pieces that have fallen from above uh, that would have made up the construction of the bath as well. And there's one coin uh, medieval that came from within the cistern itself when they were doing some test trenches in there. So in terms of a, kind of a contextual analysis, and I'm going to try to wrap up to make sure that we have time for questions. Um, so the numismatic pathways in, in terms of a contextual analysis, um, this is ongoing work that started uh, during my master's thesis. But there seems to be, as I mentioned, concentrations in areas associated with very high traffic or movement. So near floor surfaces in these surface areas, these kind of beaten earth, the coins are either just above or within the floor itself that are discovered during cleaning. And that seems to make sense for where you're going to find the most coins. Interestingly, we don't have a high concentration of coins near the main entrance, which is another area often where you'd find, say, a chest of coins, because you would need some sort of payment to get into the bath. And it's interesting because the most amount of coins that we have are imperial asses, which would have probably been the method of payment to enter in. Um, so that does also make sense with, with what we're thinking is happening with the public bath. Um, so we're also not entirely certain because of all the collapse of the vaulting and everything like that, we're dealing with a lot of phasing as well. Very hard to kind of map out the exact pathways, uh, but we do see few coins also within water or drainage contexts. Only one or two have been found there. Um, and the late antique and medieval concentration tends to be near where you're retrieving water with the cisterns or near those water areas like the uh, wells that we have dotting throughout the site. Uh, so that seems to be, at least in the late antique med medieval periods, perhaps they're kind of trying to access those areas of water um, because so much water was probably being fed from the reservoir into the bath as well. Uh, but there are a few that are falling lost into the drainage, which is interesting too. The next highest concentration of coins is near Street O, as I mentioned over here. Um, and then we have a bunch from the exterior, about those 17 coins from the exterior as well. So in the exteriors near the streets, there is a little bit of street exposed here. Uh, that is where we're also getting, which again makes sense because a lot of coins in archaeological context are associated with streets because where are you going to lose them easily in the street, right? High traffic areas. Um, and then interestingly, in the fallen wall and vaulting fragments, we might have some of the earliest material coming from those. So even some of the nicer Republican uh, materials, mid-Republican materials, that's coming from within architecture which might mean that they are 
uh, reusing materials at the site. They do have a history of reusing materials. So perhaps a lot of that missing third century material might actually be within a lot of the later architecture of the site, which we're only finding when we're trying to get through that collapse to see what the occupation levels of the bath might be. So this is something that um, I'm interested in for the future. Uh, in terms of site chronology, um, so in comparison, the numismatic material in comparison with the rest of the site, you see a lot um, kind of makes sense. We don't have any from the bath, Hellenistic or Greek definitively. Uh, they could be one of the illegible coins, but none of the clearly identified uh, coins that we have dated to that time period. Um, so we're rather low there, but it actually makes sense because very few coins are come from that period regardless. Uh, a high concentration of Republican for the bath, the highest comes from the early imperial period, and then a close second with late imperial. But then of course drops off as we see with after the fourth century CE, and then a resurgence, perhaps a few uh, to add to that count in the medieval period. So the actual bath chronology and the coins that are coming from the bath do fit in overall with this general site. Uh, but in conjunction with the ceramic material and other finds that we're um, realizing and the late per repurposing reconstruction of the site, it's still pushing that site uh, narrative back a little bit more. So you can also see a visual representation there from the um, chart with, of course, the most amount of coins coming from 1980 publication because of the long uh, duration of those excavations and the breadth that they uh, covered as well. Um, so just to kind of go over uh, in different areas of the site where we see high concentrations, it wouldn't surprise probably anybody uh, that the highest concentration of coins in general come from the forum, right? That is where out of all of the buildings, that is where we're finding the most coins. It's probably also a main hub for economic activity amongst all of the other areas of the site that have been excavated. A second comes from the arcs, the kind of religious area of the site, where we see also a, dura a long duration of occupation, repurposement of the temple as a church, and then later also into the medieval period it was being used. Uh, and also coming in third are the numerous houses, especially if you factor in the hoard, that those also are producing a number of the coins. And in comparison, again, unsurprisingly, is the bath building with the fewest amount of coins um, recovered there. But a big part of that too is because we have very rarely gone below any floor surfaces or below any areas um, that might predate the bath building. So we have not really explored the, uh, you know, exactly how low, what are the earliest phases of the area below the bath building, because we're also still really trying to focus on understanding the bath itself before trying to do any sort of exploration beneath those layers. So that could also would be um, a reason why we're finding those concentration of coins in those chronological spreads. So in terms of this new historical narrative, um, and this will be kind of the last thing that I discuss as well, uh, we have still a few objects and coins coming from the third century BCE, but often those coins do come from at least within the bath. Um, this is something I'd like to compare with other areas of the site coming from within architecture itself. Um, we also see some sort of settlement uh, continuation, though very small, Beyond this abandonment in the third century CE, we'd like to push that back because we are finding a lot of fifth to sixth century ceramics and a few anyway post fourth century coins, but not a lot. The problem with the post fourth century coins that we're seeing in archaeological context is uh, a lot of them are very illegible and a lot of them are very thin and worn and broken. So it's very hard to positively identify those as coming from those later periods. They're very easily destroyed, which is you know, a hindrance in, in, in trying to determine what's going on in that period. We also have been re-evaluating this medieval settlement. Uh, it looks like there might be some actual ceramics construction, more going on in the medieval period than we really fully understood before. So that is something that we're also trying to understand what the bath is being used for in later periods, because they're definitely using it for something. We're seeing later walls, later reuse, we're seeing some late coins, 
Uh, so these are all kind of new uh, findings that are associated with the bath that we didn't really expect in actuality. So in terms of future research, and I will end with this, um, where I'd like to go from here. So all of this material is due to be published probably in 2024, 2025. We have at least one more season left and then we'll be working on the publication, although a lot of us have been working as we go. Um, so I'd like to do a broader regional distribution study, especially during these different time periods. I know that is of interest to other colleagues as well. And then also a further distribution concentration analysis. So where are we seeing this numismatic material? How does that compare with the small finds that we're also seeing at the site? And also a big, big question mark is this architectural analysis. So more recent findings um, of these coins coming from within architecture seems to be associated with the actual construction process of the uh, buildings themselves. So because we're finding, and this is something I'd like to do a deeper analysis of, of course, finding uh, earlier material within those walls, within certain walls. So where is this material coming from? And does this mean that the missing third century BCE, although very small settlement, could be actually have uh, been reconstructed into later buildings? Um, so that is, these are all kind of avenues for further research. But thank you for, for listening to this uh, kind of preliminary research. And I will hand the floor over to questions for the last 10 minutes or so. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Melissa, really, for this uh, fantastic uh, presentation. Super interesting new stuff. So thank you very much. So I have, of course, some uh, question myself, but I'll uh, ov first open the floor uh, reading uh, uh, the questions that have been posted here on the chat. Unless uh, Daniel is here, perhaps wants to ask it himself. No, okay. So, <laughs> it, uh, no, no, th this is not Daniel, sorry, because I, no, Don, sorry, Don Square, sorry, because we already answered him. I don't know if Don would like to ask the question himself. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I'll ask very quickly, where did Koza get its water? Sure, um, so there is an actually no water source on the hill of Koza. Um, it's all limestone, and so it's not potable at all. Even today, we can't drink the water there. Um, so there were springs located near the port, but that doesn't seem, if you see a photo of Koza, there's a very steep cliff and one road going down to the port. Um, so actually, it was all rainwater fed. So that reservoir, there are several reservoirs throughout the site. That one large one was actually built in the early Republican period. A lot of the very large ones we think were one of the earliest constructed once they realized they had no water source. They had to figure that out quickly, right? Um, so the bigger reservoirs, we have about three that are large. There's a large cistern actually built into the arcs. And then there, every house we're discovering has its own cistern. So we're having a lot of underwater rain fed cisterns and they're popping up all the time. We have to be careful when we're excavating because we're constantly finding voids that turn out to be cisterns as well. And we have a lot of wells too. Just quickly follow up, could, could yep. the lack of water have been a, a, a factor in the abandonment of the site? It very well could have been. And there is actually kind of ongoing, uh, the director of the site, my advisor is um, currently researching this question as well, um, because there might have been a climate shift. We're like not entirely sure if it, you know, maybe there were just too many dry years and they weren't getting a lot of water and it wasn't feeding the site. Um, so we're not really sure, but it definitely could have been a factor in one that we're exploring. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So we have uh, another question, I mean, another observation from uh, Lore. I don't know if Lore wants to ask it uh, herself since uh, she's Hi. here. Hey. Hi there, Laura. I'm having you. By the way, congratulations, Laura. Oh, <laughs> thank you so much. This is amazing. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, sorry, I'm having lunch at the same time, so I'm staying off camera. But yeah, I was just curious to hear about a bit more about the finds that were discovered in the front of the bath, especially in the areas that are often described as floors. 
because I'm always curious. It's like, unless they were very sloppy and just leaving stuff on the floor around, often I have a suspicion that those finds are actually from fields that were above the floors and, you know, sometimes it's really hard. So um, yeah, I was just wondering if you had some input on this. Yeah, you are, you actually correctly, very right. Um, very few of the coins, uh, the ones from the service areas, there are only three or four of them coming from those areas uh, that are definitively like in the floor, as in there was a, there's a floor surface and they continued to kind of clean up and scrape into the floor and they were, rest they weren't resting on but they were within the floor surface they weren't really you know hordes or anything like that you know dugging digging into the, the floor itself um but those were in but as you mentioned a lot of them and that's why I'm, a lot of the republican material the third century material and even some of the later republican tend to come from those fill layers so they're not coming from like they're definitely not in occupation layers as we're seeing uh, they're actually coming from a lot of collapse too um, so we're kind of excavating, when I say collapse, a lot of the cases are, it's a natural, at some point the building was abandoned and either an earthquake or something, or maybe over time decay, the whole, uh, the roof and the walls, the top of the walls, and also all of the vaulting caved in and off to the side. Um, so for example, the uh, trench that I was running this summer, we had a, a hole, you could see almost like the, the roof slid off and then there was some clearing and redumping into other areas after that point in time. Um, but when that happened, uh, the coins that are coming from that are either late from the fill or they're coming from within architecture covered in mortar. Uh, so they were definitely inside the architecture at some point in time or attached to the wall or vaulting, um, but they were because of the collapse all jumbled up or because we're actually excavating through some of those vaulting pieces now that they've been pretty scanned, they're popping out of the vaulting, like quite literally you hit it with a pickaxe and it pops out. Um, so they're coming from within, the earlier ones are coming from within. Um, the later ones are, yes, coming from either within that fill just above the floor, but very few um, some the the second and third century coins, those are the ones that are somewhat coming from like inside the floor, if that makes sense. Yes, thank you so much. That's good. Yeah. I have uh, one question and actually one observation. Uh, one thing I'll begin with the observation sure. because uh, this is uh, what you're saying about uh, these. Um, these later medieval uh, layers is incredibly interesting because this is exactly what um, Columbia excavation are basically finding uh, at Villa Adriana. At Hadrian's Villa, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know that. So yeah. basically it's very interesting, would be very interesting to know what, I don't know, Seth Bernard is filing in Faleri Novi and so on because uh, actually Faleri Novi, of course, which is somewhat related to Cosa, because it seems then that uh, there is really uh, a new history <laughs> yeah. of, uh, of Italy or at of Latium and uh, Etruria to be rewritten for a fifth and sixth century uh, CE. And this is uh, a in very, very interesting, very new. And, uh, and my question, uh, um, also is about what do you make of these high concentration of coins in the machinery room on the country? Yeah. Yeah, so um, a lot of those, the one definitive coin that came from within a drain came from within that area. Um, unfortunately, the area um, was very confusing at the time. So when we call it a machinery room, we're not really certain. We just know like there's beaten earth floors. So it seems to be some sort of a service. It's not as nice. The walls are kind of rubble work, that kind of thing. And because we think that the possible bucket water wheel, we're not sure mechanism. That's what we were trying to discover this, this summer. That's been a question is how the water was getting into the bath um, coming from that area. So it, like, could it be erosion from up in the hill because it is on a slight slope? Possibly um, the lower areas are near a floor, so it could be part of that fill and the collapse. Um, so it just could be an area that, um, you know, high, high traffic still, 
uh, but because those aren't, you know, the, the coin in the drain is con like trying to figure out where that came from and the trajectory of the drain being near the water, um, it just might have been dropped at some point, um, especially if it fell out of a pocket or something like that, or with the wash rush of water, when it does torrential downpour there, you know, the water is, it floods. Um, so it, any sort of circumstance like that. Um, in terms of the concentration of coins does seem very, very interesting as well um, in that area. And so that's something that I'm still trying to figure out too. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, very well. Are there other, other uh, another question, much more personal in some way? <laughs> it is what led you to choose this as a dissertation topic? Oh, sorry, Daniel, sorry for reading the question for you. <laughs> That's quite okay. Thank you. I just, uh, it's a very interesting site, a very interesting presentation, but among all the other, there, there's like, uh, you know, a million Roman sites with these kinds of coins and kinds of hordes. And, and uh, I'm just curious, what is it about COSA that, that you're gonna put four or five years of your life into this? So I was curious, what is it about it that, that made you choose it as your dissertation topic? Sure. So um, the the coins related to the bath is is not really part of the dissertation. You know, the the third century coins do interest me, and that's kind of a side project and a potential article in the future as well about the architecture. Um, but my dissertation, which focuses mainly on the third century BCE and also the transition in the second century, um, that period of the earliest kind of period of Kosa's history is almost non-existent from literary sources. It's not really discussed what's happening there in the first during the first Punic War. It's not until the second Punic War that it's even mentioned at all and its harbor is the only thing that's really mentioned. Um, so you have this brand new city that the Romans you know, founded in this very volatile area with a lot of, surrounded by Etruscan neighbors, right? It's the only colony that in that area and it's overlooking both the coast, but then also has to worry about its neighbors. So everyone kind of discussed how a lot of the countryside might have been displaced. The settlement patterns were, were rearranged because of course, with the colonial project of the Romans at that time, but no one had really um, looked into one, why Coase is minting coins if they're such a small colony and nothing's going on there, well then why the coins, right? Um, they had been extensively studied and attributed to Coase, but nobody had really looked at where they're going. There is a distribution pattern that was published, but why those locations, um, a regional distribution, but why those cities, what contexts that uh, they are appearing in and why, what is the significance of that? And what other type of I mean, you know, networks or um, overlapping patterns may explain why the coins were distributed in those areas, right? So um, kind of, trying to better understand how COSA fits into the mid-Republican narrative and then the mid-Republican history, archeology, span um, that has really been, they just, a lot of the early excavators said, um, we don't find anything from this period. These are a few things we can date to there and then we're moving on. Um, so it's not really discussed how they might've interacted with their neighbors and especially with these very interesting coins that um, have a lot of, things, you know, weird things going on. And it's funny because the colony is always called weird and so are the coins. So it, it's kind of fitting. Well, that's lovely. It does sound like you really will be able to add something new to the to the general historical picture. Thank you for a very, very uh, precise answer. It's very interesting to hear your perspective on it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, last question before, because we are already over time, but I think this is very interesting from uh, uh, Warren Astia. Yeah. Um, I don't know if he wants to ask the question himself, but... Uh... I, I was just going to ask what the natural advantages of the site were. You said it has a port. How far away is that? So the port is actually modern terms uh, within walking distance, only a few kilometers away. And there was a major road that connected um, there was a main gate that actually exited out by the forum down to the port. So it's likely that, you know, you have ships coming in and then you had them pulling up, uh, bringing up goods to the city. And that's how the city kind of market 
you know, functioned and that kind of thing. Um, the harbor was really good at the time, and it actually was perfect for both uh, salt production, fish production, garum production, and wine in the region too. Was ships uh, the second century uh, that Sesti family that I mentioned really capitalized on its perfect harbor and um, built a villa there as well and uh, really kind of monopolized the, the trade and in, in that region. Um, but again, who knows what's, <laughs> which I forgot what's going on in the third century. Um, but uh, the, the usual position or the reason for the founding was that fall of Volci, Rome confiscated that land from Volci, and they were really worried about defense. This is pre, like right before the first Punic War, right, that this is founded. So there's the connections, military functions has been the biggest reason for um, that location plus the port down below. Uh, we don't have any evidence of any large fleet at all kind of being constructed as has been posited in the in the past uh, at the port, but the port was important. It did harbor ships. We do have some literary accounts of ships taking kind of um, safe harbor there. There were some pirate attacks off the coast and that kind of thing. So it was a major thoroughfare. It became a major thoroughfare connecting Italy, Rome, Italy, you know, Central Italy, Etruria on the wine trade as well in later history, so it really blossomed there. Um, and that also is uh, that the town itself um, was more of like, that's why they thought it was that the towers were built there into the walls again for like those defensive purposes. There was no major battle we know of that happened there, you know, it was more to the north in uh, Palamone, but um, in more defensive purposes. Uh, and then it, they eventually also built the Via Aurelia, which is still there too, not long after the, the colony was founded. So you have a major road going right at the bottom of the colony. And then you also have a major port that's happening over there as well, which does is one of the best ports on, on that coast. So. Does it have a good water supply with the river? Um, not so much. So the, the site itself, uh, Coza itself, is rain fed, rainwater fed, right? So uh, there is no real water source. The, um, the water at the port, though, they did cut a channel uh, very early on, uh, kind of connecting over into what used to be the lagoons. Those were all silted up um, in the 40s. So they're not really accessible anymore. But if you go there today, there is a very large fishery that is rightly, you have to drive past it on the way up to site. So fishery and um, fishing productions and salt production and all that is, was very heavy in the region as well. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you. of course. Thank you, Melissa, for this fantastic and very interesting presentation. And, Thank you. Uh, we're looking forward to your next presentation. <laughs> Okay, and uh, thank you very much.